Wait, I downloaded this? Where? Why is it not downloaded, Jake? What did you do? So we did an episode where we were looking at future JavaScript stuff. We did. It was, people like that. Yes. Uh, so what I thought we'd do is look at new stuff that's already landed. Oh, I thought you were going to say, let's look at old stuff. And we're like, well, that doesn't make Well, I think new stuff that's already landed is, is probably how you would define old stuff, really. <laughs> I, so I feel like I'm doing a bad job of introducing what this actually is. So I'm just going to let's show you. Let's look at ES3. Let's, well, yes. Oh, I was trying to make a joke. But <laughs> Don't ever do that again, mate. Just, <laughs> just, uh, just tell me what, what is going on here. Oh, this is, this is like the throwback to object-oriented programming in JavaScript before we had classes, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Where you, like, you, you define a function, and suddenly you can add properties on the prototype of that function. It sounds really weird, but that's how you did. So what's, ha what's happening? So, talk to so me. you define talk a function car. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about what's inside the function for now. But yeah. then you can add things on the prototype of this function called car. Mm. And I think that prototype is used when you create use the function with the new keyword. So if I say new car, then the things I have in the prototype in that thing, I can use also on the instance of car. That was a really bad explanation. It's, it, was, it was. Because, But also, Correct. it's um, I always find it confusing. Like it's in, it's what is it called in a prototypical inheritance? Uh, yes, something like pro that. Pro prototypal, prototypical. Like, and but what what about? So I'm I'm not. Oh, you're just already doing weird stuff. This is this. So I guess we should explain that you you were relatively recent to the web. Like you yeah. ramped up fast. I yeah I never. But you did. will have never have done this. I've done it at university. Not not that specific. I just used car dot prototype dot first function equals and then the function. Then. But this. Car inherits from vehicle. And this is how we used to do inheritance. But that's disgusting. It, yes, isn't it? Isn't it horrible? Wow. Because I mean, I, that's where people use frameworks, right? Or like yeah. little little libraries that would give you that. Exactly. And so because you want the you want car.prototype to be an instance of vehicle, but vehicle has you need to call the function with stuff. It has options and, and things. So what you needed to do oh. is create a new constructor, copy the prototype over, or reference the prototype over, mm -hmm. create a new one of those. And that meant your car now inherits from vehicle. And then here, this is where you were doing the, the super call. My point is, look at classes. This is what we have yeah. now. I mean, so this is what I want to talk I, about, is, is just the, some of the things that we've got now. That we're taking for granted almost, isn't it? That we almost take for granted. It reminds the old version, the prototypical inheritance, always reminds me of Lua, where you only have tables and you have tables within tables if you want to inherit. It just gets super weird. It feels very similar. And this is just oh, feels better. Never done Lua. I'll take your word for it. What's happening here? You were defining a function called spin. Correct. Let's take a closer look. So the options. Oh, OK. So this is basically sanitization of the options object. Yes. Um, which. You know, I, even there's also libraries where you just define in a syntax what the options object should look like. Because otherwise, you would have to write this. And this is just like, it took me a while to actually understand what you were doing. And now I didn't read every detail because I recognized the pattern because I've written that before. Yes. If you don't know the pattern, this would be a lot of reading time spent until you know, oh, you are just checking that certain properties are present. And if they're not, you're setting the default value. Yes. And this got a lot easier with. Um, Object.assign, which was essentially what the, the library yeah. tool. We all had a, a you know a library doing something like object.assign, and that's what we'd use here. But nowadays, destructuring with default values. Wow. Yes. So what we see here, we're destructuring, we're giving it the default values, yeah. and then a default value for the option object there. So it's entirely optional. But I I brought this example for a reason. Because I don't like it. Because you don't like it, do you? <laughs> I, so I do like the structuring and default values. I've gotten around to it a little bit. I don't like it in the actual function parameter definition. I prefer this, yeah. Yes. Where you destructure in a separate place. Because otherwise, it, like, it gets a little bit nested, and it looks a bit crammed. Um, and especially if you have TypeScript. It gets mm. even weirder, because then you, the types just go all over the place. So some, when I use TypeScript, I often have a type that's called function name with the word options appended to the end, where I define what structure the options object have. And then I have the first line in my function will then assign the default values. Yeah, and, and I agree. I, um, 
Yeah, this, this looks a, a, a lot neater. The reason I would still do this is because a static analyzer knows that this, these are the properties of the option object. In this case, True. it's not as so clear. That's basic. This is basic, probably prefer preferable if you don't have touch screen. Right, so that's that. What's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know what's happening here, we I have need to, to get out. We have five. <laughs> yeah. You are making the DOM element with a class, whatever, be 100, 100 pixel wide, Mealy. Mealy. 100 <laughs> pixel tall. Well saved. So I spend a lot of my time uh, designing mm. in DevTools. Um, yes. I'll, I'll, put some, I'll throw some rough styles just into um, the editor. Yeah. And then I'll go into DevTools, and that's where I'll be shifting values around to make it look. Then at the end, you copy and paste. Copy them. and paste. <laughs> exactly <laughs> that. Thing. Yeah. In this case, editing this in DevTools is hard because what I want in this case, I want whatever to be the same width as it is high. Like I want it to have. I want it to be square. Is how a human would say that. Yeah. Um, and it means that if I'm like shifting values around in DevTools, mm. I shift one. And then I have to tab twice or whatever and yeah. shift the other one. And that's a pain. So here's one of the solutions. Yes, that's the proper solution, I'd say. Yeah. And it's been nice now that this is supported in like all modern browsers. Yeah. I've just found this a dream. And it's it's for what no... it's worth, size is coming to CSS. Is that right? And it is yeah. just an alias for width plus height. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. I didn't yeah, because know that. we have it in a lot of other things. For example, I think uh, background image size. All, certain other size properties exist where you can have one value or two values. And if it's right. only one value, it's the same for width and height. But we don't have it for the actual size of so a DOM element. So size becomes a shortcut for width and height in the yeah. same way. And font but you can also do size for... 100 pixels, 200 pixels if you want it to be 100 pixels wide and In the same way you do for background yeah. size. Exactly. Right. Oh, OK, no, that's good. But in the meantime, this for works. For now, this works, yeah. Right. What's happening here? You haven't. I'm assuming that UL and LI are well-named variables, and you're not trying to throw me off. Nope. So you have a list that you add a click handler, and then you get the event target from the LI. And if it's not an LI, then you say, well, or you bubble up. Oh, OK. So what you're doing is you you basically do the event delegation, where you have one click handler on the UL instead of like each individual list item. And then you try to figure out on the click event what is the actual list item that you click yeah. on? And so, so one event listener on the list, yeah. but you're using it to detect a click on all the list items. So that means you can move those list items around, add yeah. and remove them. You don't have to change the list. But then the problem becomes that if your list item has like an anchor tag, that event or target might be the anchor tag within the list item. Well, it might just be the list itself. Or it might be the list itself. Click to list item. So and now what you have to do is you actually have to walk up the tree manually to find what the containing list element is if it exists. Yeah, and I always found this, it, it's only a little bit of code, but it always felt like a barrier to using event delegation. Yeah. Uh, whereas now, we got closest. We got closest, and it's so good because it, it doesn't have to be a tag name, it can be a class name. I wonder if I did a, a supercharged episode in this. Oh, wait, I did. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I did worry that maybe there's going to be a lot of crossover between no, no, what no. I show now and supercharged. No, I probably but should this watch is just show, because, uh, as far as I know, closest was inspired by jQuery. Well, and I did the jQuery series. Well, there might be some of those coming up as well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's carry on. Um, what, what is happening here? Uh, good luck. <laughs> All right, wait, all right. So you're you're replacing just a plus because mm. that's the right with no anything before the plus. So will that match pluses? Uh, so yes, that would be a literal pl plus. Yep. That's wow, fine. that is yeah. confusing because usually the plus means the preceding matcher once or many times repeated. But if there's no preceding matcher, that I'm, is... I'm pretty sure that works. Some of these I haven't checked thoroughly. <laughs> I'm pretty I, sure that I works. would probably backslash it for clarity anyway, unless it then breaks because regex is. Get okay, over the first but, line. OK, yeah. We're replacing pluses with spaces. Yep. And then we have a result. Uh, oh, you are totally parsing URLs, aren't you? Yes, I am. Well, specifically, the um, query string. The query string. Yeah, because you're, yeah. Uh, space, spaces are encoded as pluses. And the individual parameters are separated by ampersands. Yep. And then you do the, the equality split. Then actually, in the end, oh, you do the URI component decode. That is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And it looks I, I and of the examples. And it's because the browser can actually understand encoding. And doing it yourself is super frustrating. Exactly. And it's, it's useful to look at the URL to decide stuff. It, it could either be the current URL, or it could be the URL of a link, or it could be some form data that you're trying to send, because yeah. it's the same encoding. 
and having to do this to figure it out, uh, I, the URL search params. It's I yeah. yeah. It's just so much nicer that we have it that is. now, and we have that across all modern I'm browsers. I'm still very annoyed that they didn't add a new property onto the location object. So do you know why? So no. it is on. Uh, if you do new URL and pass a URL in, you now have URL dot search params, yeah. which is an instance of this, which yeah. is representing which the is query great. string. Uh, the problem is, the location object mm -hmm. is available across Windows. Um, also, if I open a window, I can get access to the. Yeah, and even if that window is in another process, like a, an iframe, mm -hmm. uh, you still have access to the location object. Okay. And this has been the whole problem of implementing that, is having this this extra object that exists. Into, Why and that's not a problem. Well, because we have window proxy, right? Mm. And so we would ne need the equivalent of a search params proxy oh. um, because of things like expandos and all of that sort of stuff. It's not referencing exactly the same object. I would be fine if we just defined a getter function that like just gives me a new instance. In but the same realm or something. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just, just like every time out. I do like new URL search, or new URL, and then location dot to string or something, and just yeah, yeah, exactly. It's but it's a small. Will compared to what we had to do before. Agreed. It's it's workaroundable, but it would be nice if it was there. But yeah, this this you know get us setters. It does the encoding, the decoding, and it's it's just there, yeah. and it's brilliant, excellent. So, ah, oh, file reader. Yeah, yeah, that was. I it's I'm 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 not sure about file reader. So it like was supposed to help you read blobs and files that are given from like file pickers and these kind of things, and it's like this super non-promised based API, which are always great. It's like XHR, but for files in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like is the support like super flaky across browser? Is this actually No, this, this is well supported. Um, as you say, it, it predates promises. Um, it will take a blob or a file, because file inherits from blob. Mm. If you wanted to, to take that, because blob is you don't get access to the bytes. Mm. If you want access to the bytes as like you know text or an array buffer, yeah. this is the mess you would have to deal with. Um, nowadays Yes. And I said something that, I, that you recently taught me, or you tweeted it, I think, and that's where I learned it. Um, yeah, I never thought about abusing response in that way. I don't think it's actually abused. Because well, it's creating a response when you don't really need to just because it has these methods on yeah, it, right? Yeah, but it's suddenly promise based, much more concise. It's actually, you know what's going on, and I yeah. think that's a big difference. And that's one of the things we, when we designed the response API, we want it to be very easy to yeah. get these other formats out, like text array buffer, those sort of yeah. things, and nice promise based API. Obviously, async functions are a thing we didn't used to have that I take for granted yeah. now um, yeah. in all major browsers. So much easier. Right. This is the last one. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, if you can at least get a flavor for what's uh, um, what's going on here, we are getting a creating a styles object. We are creating a random animation, generating the animation algorithm with is a wide translation. We add the new styles, then we add that new animation to an object. Wait for. Do you know what? I'll say I'll save you time. <laughs> This is if you're wanting to create a programmatic animation. I see. Because back in the day, you only had CSS. Yes. So if I wanted to animate from something to something else, yeah. this is the kind of thing I have to do. I have to you create, create the keyframes. An ad hoc keyframe animation, add it as a style tag. And, then, and this is because like an animation could end or it could cancel. So I need to listen for both to know when the animation's done and do you know, turn that into a promise. And blah, it's blah, blah, blah. blah. Ta-da. Web Animations API. It's finally coming to a point where it becomes usable across browsers. Yeah. And this is this is themed differently from the other examples, because we still don't have this. And it's not well, it, well, we have it in Chrome, at least a subset. Of we don't have the finished promise. No, we don't. We still um, don't. That's true. And do you know whose fault that is? That's my, my mom's? That's, well, <laughs> by extension, yes. <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> Um, because at the time that he designed this, it was um, we hadn't decided what to do with cancelable promises at the time, oh. and because finished is a is a promise that may cancel, mm. um, I, I I put the brakes on it and said like we can't ship this yet because it might be, turn out to be incompatible. Ladies and gentlemen, please tweet at Jake. I'm sorry. <laughs> and do you know what's worse? The thing they were doing is what we ended up doing. <laughs> so if we shipped it, it would have been fine. But, well, I used to um, do a 
a JavaScript library for the BBC, and we were having to target things like um, Safari 1.3. Nice. And it's it, this is the sort of stuff, like all of this stuff I showed. I was killed for this stuff back yeah. then. And it's it is nice to see that you know we look at the future cool stuff that might land, and it's like oh that looks interesting. And it's nice to stop and look that things have got better. We've got nice things now. Things have got better. I tend to on stage. I lock my arms in. But not the front. Like my front. I walk around just like, that, like a camp zombie. Is that armpit sort of, uh, sweat fear? I think it might be that. Yeah. So I, I have that. Like so, so I'm uh, talking. <laughs> <laughs> and here's how this is working. T-Rex mode engaged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Typing on my keyboard. Driving my car.